So, uh, hi, I'm Duncan Weatherson. I am the COO of Simpatico uh, Intelligent Systems. And I'm going to be talking today about my experiences implementing a fire repository um, at the provincial level. I've been working in healthcare for quite some time. I got involved with EHRs in Ontario uh, in the early 2000s, but I've been working in healthcare since the late 90s. And before that, I was involved in IT from the late 80s. So I've been sort of around the block a couple of times, and um, I've owned my own business in the past. So we've, we've creating this uh, presentation, I sort of tried to play off my experiences in the past against what we're trying to deliver today. Um, sorry, I'm just going fast for so. This is what happens when you lose your speaker notes. Um, okay, so let me talk a bit about the repository that we created. The repository we created is a drug repository. It's got over a billion records in it, and it's growing at a rate of over 500,000 transactions a day. Uh, it's built around the um, clinical dispensation, the, no, the clinical notification of drug dispenses for clinicians, and it's got to respond very quickly. It's got to respond sub-second and make it available for clinicians in their day-to-day -day operations. The, data we're getting is not um, in a fire format. We're getting data into our repository currently uh, from a single source and it's in a sort of database mode and then we have to go and con construct fire messages from the data that we're getting and we have to make it available uh, to our repository and then share it out. And um, it's been a bit of a challenge to try and get there because we had to take the original data, parse through it, we had to figure out how to map it all over and then put it into a clinical repository uh, in a way that made sense, both from a performance perspective, when you're dealing with over a billion records, trying to respond in under a second is already a challenge enough on its own, but also in a way that would align with the uh, needs of the clinical viewers and in align with the business. So it was, it, was, it was a significant effort in the mapping of information. The good news was that with the tooling that was available, once we figured out the mapping, the presentation of that data as fire resources was relatively straightforward. Um, so we chose fire. Well, for a number of reasons. First and foremost is because we can't really create our own standard. I mean, obviously, uh, there are opportunities for other organizations out there to build APIs that work, but when you're making a provincial repository, you can't sort of hope for the best, say, this is what we think is a really great interface, and then expect everybody else is going to adopt it. We have to work in our environment with, um, you know, multinational vendors like Cerner and, and uh, Epic and Meditech in Canada and a variety of those things. So in order for us to proceed, we did have to pick something that was going to be globally adopted. Um, we could have stayed with HL7 v2 because it is globally adopted and, and functional, but the challenge there is that is every single integration ends up being a unique integration, and so we couldn't reasonably expect to proceed down that path. Um, HL7 v3, I probably don't need to say any more about that. Uh, I think everybody in this room has gone probably through one experience or another where they realized that it looked really good. I think the, the way that it was expressed best to me is by James, who said, the guys who invented HL7 v3 are all geniuses because they're the only ones who understand what they did. Um, <laughs> so we, we selected Fire because, in fact, it seems to fit well with the deployment and implementation. Um, we think that it's easily adoptable, and it, you know we'll get to the discussion of that in a bit. And it seems we were sort of proved right about that in terms of some of the experiences that we've had. Um, so extensibility, I want to talk about that a little bit. In OLIS, what we discovered was that none of the lab data we wanted to share quite fit in with what was anticipated in a V2 message. And so there's a beautiful mechanism in V2 called a Z segment. So I'm going to dive off to a bit of technology. So let me, let me constrain my speech here. I'll talk a bit on the business side for some people, then I'll talk a bit on the technology side for others because we've got a mixed audience. So I'm going to dive a bit right now into the HL7 v2 land. I'm going to talk about the fact that we had Z segments. And it's great. You can create a thing which represents your data perfectly, except that now you don't have HL7 v2. You have the oldest flavor of HL7 v2 where every single message is unique to its own implementation and nobody can consume it without a round of development, which takes a long time. So earlier on, um, Ken had a picture of Olus looking like a demolished house. It was unfortunate, but the, <laughs> the, the, the real issue was that in our attempt to try and uh, meet all of the standards and requirements that we had in, in 2003, we built a system which fit well within the standard space that we had, but really did take a long time to get people to adopt. 
Um, so we need this extensibility in the case of the drug repository as well, where you can sort of take uh, the current medication and add on things which really weren't considered when the spec was being built. In our case, uh, there's a thing called a drug utilization report where a clinician can, where, where a patient has, say, a circumstance under which the medication that they're about to take may not be appropriate. So either, for example, they have an allergy to that medication, or they're taking another medication which conflicts with it, or you know they're, they're, an opi they're getting an opiate and this is the third doctor they've talked to today. There, there's a number of reasons why we'd want to issue a report about that, and that didn't exist in the spec when we were getting to it. So we were able to extend it. But the good news is with FHIR that, in fact, the way they designed the solution, you can build an extension without breaking the base functionality. This 80-20 rule that exists in FHIR is really flexible and delivers the capability for any organization that wants to participate to retain their interoperability and yet have their own characteristics within their data. This is a big deal for us. Um, and lastly, it's the ease of use for consumer application developers. And my story on that is we, we've dealt with a couple of hospitals now on sort of can you adopt our interface quickly. And uh, for example, Sunnybrook built an interface for proof of technology in two days. When we were talking to our friends at uh, Hamilton Health Sciences, they built their first implementation to show they could do it in under a week. Everybody we've talked to for an adoption, can you integrate with this, just gets it done right away because it follows modern web standards. It's a RESTful interface. Uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'm pre preempting myself on my other conversation here. Um, it it, it pr basically provides a really um, rapid development environment. <coughs> so what we found, the existing tools really simplified development. We built um, using Happy as our product base on DHDR, um, and we found that by deploying that, we were able to get the mechanics of integration out of the way very quickly. So we were able to spend our time uh, data mapping source from source to fire. Like I said earlier on, this was a challenging concept. We get our data presented to us as a database copy. And so now we're trying to select from it was like 40 tables we had to go through to figure out how to construct our messages. And that was where we spent a bunch of our effort and time was trying to figure out how to construct these fire messages and make them available. Once we figured that out, it was relatively straightforward to put them in. Data validation. So we get a bunch of information in, and in our environment, we need to know who's the provider, who's the patient, is this a valid patient? And I'll talk about a bit about it later from an AI perspective, but this is a key issue we're going to have to face is now that we're starting to gather all this information, how do we assure ourselves that what we have is longitudinality really is? Because in the, in the space where we're giving information to doctors, before they can rely on us completely, they have to trust that we're not going to be lying to them about what we're saying. Um, data population, we had a billion records to catch up on, so that was a big deal. That took us a while just grinding through all of them and getting them into the database. And the last piece is designing the database for performance. Once again, because we had the tooling in place, we could spend a bunch of time trying to figure out how do we get our data presented um, in a timely fashion that lives up to the expectations of people who live in a Google world. Um, just a quick aside, uh, people often accuse me of talking quickly. If I am talking too quickly, forgive me. Um, so this is actually a common problem that we actually, for, for, for the applications we've built to date, because people are used to Google saying, searched 400 trillion records in a 30th of a second, here's all your data, sir, while you're typing. When people interact with clinical systems, and the clinical systems take you know, a whole tens of seconds or even seconds, they're outraged. Despite the fact that the data itself used to take them three weeks when they had to have to call all the hospitals and get it shipped to them, because once you put it onto a screen, they're expecting to see Google. If you don't meet up to those standards, people will actually hold you accountable and, and call up and complain. Not that I'm speaking from experience. So one of the really cool things we discovered, and it's a piece that has grown on us, this idea of a messaging specification as an API. And it's core, if you go to take a look at the first FHIR presentations, they talk about this, it's a really good way of thinking about things. So in the old days, what we used to have is we have this messaging specification where like HL7 v2, you take this big long string of, of, well, bars, and you throw them on a wire, and you send it from one side to the other, and the people who receive it um, then interpret this collection of information and treat it as a record. And this model has worked so well. I mean, HL7v2 is still around. This this idea of I can construct a package, put it on a wire, send it from A to B, well, send it from A to B, and the applications that receive it will understand what to do with that data and how to, how to make it um, into a clinical record. And that's a core concept in, 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 in the API. But the cool thing that FHIR said is, you know what, why don't we 
on top of that messaging, which has all this clinical information and knowledge baked into it, make each of those resources available in a modern, restful fashion so that you can get, get me my patient as simple as a URL, get me my patient. It becomes this idea that I can build an API into the messaging spec so that normal developers can leverage the business logic that's gone into all these years of message creation. And that's the thing that really, really played out well for us. Great, I have to go really quick. Amazing, I'll have to even talk faster. Um, so, what we found was it simplified the solution design, and although I just finished saying that it's really great for developers, if you came from a world where you're used to the Twitter API, or you're used to uh, Amazon's API, or you're used to like, one of these custom built, we deliver one message, I hope you like it, click the next button, um, then you're going to seem complex. If you're used to coming from HL7 v3, or where you have to deal with this whole idea that the messaging spec is associated with clinical data, Suddenly, this seems really simple. I can say, this whole package that you're getting is a drug dispense, and then you as a developer can look through the fields and say, ah, that's what that part is. One of the core things that we realized early on is you need a strong standards team, and um, our standards team is sitting over here. He was incredibly helpful. Um, what we use standards team for is, how do we map this data to fire? The standards guys are brilliant at going and talking to the business, figuring out what the business wants, taking a look at the spec, figuring out how it's supposed to fit in. They're the guys who make that magic happen between how does the business work and how does the messaging spec work and fit it all together. Um, they helped us understand when to make the extensions and they helped us decide between the various options within the specification itself. Should I put an enclosed message? Should I keep it open? There's a whole bunch of questions. So when you're, when you're implementing your solutions and you want to figure out how you're going to interact, Keep your standards friends handy, they are incredibly important. Um, so considerations. Rest instead of soap. This was a simple decision for us, it worked really well. Um, fire is not as simple as tw Twitter or Facebook, um, and we just discussed that. Fire is not normative yet. So there's a whole bunch of things in fire that claim that they're not mature, they're not fully matured yet. It's okay. You know, one of the things that we're trying to accomplish here is integration, and the parts that we're dealing with are things with long-standing business values. So if the way I frame that, that particular business um, idea or concept changes over time, it's okay because as long as you're capturing the business concepts that are important to you, you'll be able to adapt. And if you use the tooling properly, you won't have to do any work to adapt. It'll just adapt for you as long as the business concepts you're working with retain their consistency. Uh, please consider an agile approach. When we were doing our development, we followed an agile path all the way, and it enabled us to deliver our solution under eight months. Um, implementation guides are essential, so once you're building your solution, a really critical path that we found was helpful for all of the adopters was for us to have a clear documentation of our spec, how all of the parts pull together, and how to use it. Um, that was a fundamental thing that's enabled, that's why people were able to build in two days, because they had great documentation to work from. Um, and don't forget about security, privacy, and auditing. Uh, build it into your solution as you go. Um, so the Fire API and searching, this is, a, this is one of the things that's super cool about Fire. Um, Fire allows you to do these queries where you can very simply get at your data. So for example, each resource is a direct path in, or you can extend the scope of your queries to the point where you're doing a lot of your business logic on the back end. So for example, um, I'm going to give you some examples coming up, so I'm going to blow past this. Uh, for example, if you want to get a patient with, whose name is D. Smith. It'll assume that that's the user ID is D, or the patient ID is D Smith. If you want to get the data for that patient, you can just do get patient D Smith. Very, very simply. You can use like, very simple tools as a developer to see right away your data come back to you. Say you want to increase, inc include perhaps observations and labs. So there's, once again, a very simple URL. Get patient D Smith and include observations and include diagnostic reports. And Bob's your uncle. You get back a bunch of messages from your repository with that information in it. You can get even more complex if you want. So for example, get me all of the patients that have an observation where that observation was, has an audit event from a specific user. So tell me, very in one single string, make a query that says, tell me all the users who looked at this particular patient's observations. This gives you as a privacy perspective or any of those types of interactions where you care about monitoring the system use, a very easy pathway to develop UIs that are able to get you that kind of stuff. All of these features are available to you when you adopt Fire and it's, why you should be considering it despite the fact that it's not deemed to be normative. It gets you the solutions you need quickly and it makes it very easy for your developers. Um, so future considerations, Smart on Fire. I want to talk about briefly about that. I'm going to go a little bit over time on this, unfortunately. Smart on Fire is a mechanism for, and we've actually got a, we've got 
the head of Smart on Fire here to talk to us. This is very exciting. Uh, Smart on Fire is a mechanism for building applications which work with fire solutions. And it means that once you start implementing fire, you've got the flexibility to start building applications that work against it right away. And we'll continue to work with other um, corporations' applications as well. So you're no longer locked into, I'm building something for that vendor. I'm building something across all my vendors that I'm expecting to return back useful information. And maybe uh, we'll even have a demo of that a little bit later on. An event framework. So one of the things we're looking for is um, using the concept of subscription. So this is a built-in fire notion. It's this idea of subscriptions. And with an event framework, I'm actually going to switch the pages which actually talk about this. <laughs> An event distribution uh, framework allows you to, when messages arrive in your repository, tell other applications in your environment right away, oh, this message has arrived and you're interested in it because of some rule you've created. This is a really important future um, implementation because as we start to have these, um, as was alluded to earlier on, collections of applications are interested in the information, we don't necessarily want to create a giant polling storm where every application is polling every resource all the time. You've got an opportunity to actually start telling people when things happen that they're interested in. And uh, this is another important issue um, that was alluded to earlier on. The data store as an ecosystem component. So one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at how do I um, let everything tap into my data store? Rather than, than again, creating 1,000 applications, all of which have their own independent data stores, um, like we talked about, how about we create a data store and then allow things to interact with that data store, either through notification or through um, an API interface or through callbacks. And by building out this notion of data stores as a core plant member of the ecosystem, you can now start bringing other people on to start creating their own little applications and adding value themselves, either you know, as independent businesses that want to get some value from, from a provincial repository or um, as, uh, as small projects that you kick off yourself. Um, example of that would be, for example, a natural language processing plugin which allows all of your inbound data to be looked, streamed through. So one of the common data sets that we get is things like discharge summaries. So if you put a natural language processing plug into your data store, suddenly you can pick out the labs or the drugs or the, the allergies from that data set and populate it as real data rather than as just text data which someone has to read through. Uh, clinical pathways plugin would be another one. So for example, as data arrives, being able to recommend to clinicians um, that their patient needs some additional treatment as a consequence would be a good idea. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about the importance of clever algorithms, machine learning, and AI. One of the core things, I alluded to this earlier on, I'm trying to get to it quickly, is um, that we get this big data set in. And right now, what we do to try and figure out, is this data about you, is we look at some card number that showed up with that data, and we assume that because the card number matched and your date of birth matched on that card, and the, the header information all says it's you, that this data is about you. But we know full well that that's not necessarily true, because a lot, at least in our province, of the data we get is billing data, right? So because you have an OHIP card, you use this number to be insured, and it gets you payment for diseases. So for example, if you've just turned 65, but your spouse is 62, the doctor might help you out if you're not really doing very well from a finance perspective, and put the prescription in your name because we'll cover it on ODB and then you'll give that prescription to your spouse when you get home afterwards. And so that data will look perfect to us. We'll say, look at that, the health card number matches, the date of birth matches, the gender matches, but why is Sam on hormone replacement therapy? And this gives us an opportunity by, by, by using the data which arrives in our repository, gives us an opportunity to start evaluating longitudinality and other things. And that it goes back to what Chime said earlier on, which is that um, we have this big data repository. People are sending us all of their records and we can add value with a fire repository saying, look, here's all the data. And then, now that I've got it all collected in one place, I can start doing really clever things with learning algorithms to figure out if the data makes sense, to figure out if it's longitudinal, to figure out if it fits in. And all of these things are gonna come from us making these reasonably strong collections of information centrally. And I think that kind of wraps up my speech.